I would like to start by uh, introducing uh, our speaker for today. He has uh, been an ambassador for the Ubuntu community for quite some time, which is really nice that we have someone from the community, uh, that leadership position in our group here. So we're very <coughs> thankful. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Nathan's been working on a special project for a while. I'm not going to steal his thunder and give it away. For those of you who don't know, I will let him talk about it today as part of his presentation, which is writing and publishing with free software. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Nathan Haynes. Thank you. My name is Nathan Haynes, and um, I'm here from Ubuntu. So today I'd like to uh, take some time to uh, talk about writing and publishing books using free software. So, uh, just like it says on the tin. So I'm a computer enthusiast, and um, I've been a, uh, a programmer when I was little, a gamer, and computer, te computer technician. So um, uh, I've been using uh, computers for a very long time. I've been a, com profe a professional computer technician for about 19 years now, and using computers for uh, a lot longer, more, more around maybe 28, 30 years. So um, I am an Ubuntu member, so I'm one of the uh, co-leaders of the Ubuntu California local community team. And uh, what a local community team does in Ubuntu is uh, we, um, we handle speaking engagements, uh, running booths at expos like the SoCal Linux Expo, for example. We do install fests and um, release parties. So uh, for those of you, uh, for the online audience, if you would like to have um, someone from, from Ubuntu represent, uh, give a talk or uh, have a, a special event, uh, you can get a hold of your local community team. Um, it's loco for short because we're crazy about Ubuntu, so you can find your local community team worldwide at loco, L-O-C-O, dot Ubuntu dot com. Um, I'm also a member of the Ubuntu Local com Community Council, and what we do is basically we sort of oversee the local community, community team project uh, worldwide. We don't do too much, but if, there, um, if uh, any local team needs special uh, resources or uh, help getting uh, CDs, for example, uh, for a special event, or if there are any disputes or administrative uh, problems, we can step in and we can make sure, for example, that uh, the Launchpad team, uh, people get access to that and, and, and give advice on starting everything out. So um, those are my uh, sort of Ubuntu uh, credentials. Now, uh, I'm also an author, and I've been an author for uh, several years. Um, I've done a lot of introductory tutorial magazine articles for uh, Linux Identity, for example. And right now, uh, I'm finishing up work on a book called Beginning Ubuntu for Windows and Mac users. And uh, it'll be published by A-Press in uh, very, very shortly, another, another month or so, um, probably end of September, uh, early October. Um, and you can go to my website, www.nhames.com, and uh, you can see an affiliate link to my book and order pre-order the book there. Uh, it should be a fantastic book if you've, um, if you, uh, if you've if you or you have a friend who is good with computers and who knows you know, what a web browser is, knows how to use email and so on, and you want to get started with Ubuntu, uh, this is a, a great resource that, that kind of brings in, walks you through the install process, uh, introduces you to all types of software that does all sorts of different things so that you can get an even footing. Uh, and then uh, once you're comfortable and familiar, it talks you through things like uh, some fun things to do on the command line. It doesn't teach you how to use the command line. It teaches you some cool things like uh, e-links, so if you see what the web looked like before uh, 1995, you know, we can uh, take you back there. Some games, some little utilities, and some, some power user settings like virtual desktops and so on. So um, it's a really great uh, resource for people who know how to use a computer, um, but then want to go to Ubuntu. It doesn't walk you through, this is a file, this is a monitor and a keyboard. Um, so uh, I'm really excited for that. Um, pitch aside, um, so uh, those are my credentials for, for talking about publishing. I, I'm a hybrid author. I've self-published and traditional, uh, traditionally published as well. Um, so I want to um, say, first of all, that all of the software I talk about today is available on Ubuntu, which I want to uh, promote. If, you, um, if you're watching this and you, uh, you're, you like the idea of all the software, you want to know where to begin, you can start with Ubuntu. It's a complete solution for uh, all your computing needs. Um, that one installation gives you this nice, fresh, clean uh, desktop, as you see there. Uh, keeps your virus, uh, your, your computer virus-free uh, and uh, up to date with security updates and so on. 
And it's built entirely from free and open source software, minus a couple of firmware bits so that your, moder your graphics card works, for example. So um, depending on your graphics card or your network card. So uh, if you are already using Ubuntu, then you know how wonderful uh, this resource is. If you use a different Linux distro, uh, then you know as well as I do that uh, that Linux distro will probably have all of the software I discussed today uh, and is just as a valid and as wonderful solution for you. Um, but if someone's starting out from whole cloth, I, I definitely recommend uh, Ubuntu. So publishing. Why publish a book in the first place? There's a, an old saying that everyone has a book in them. We've heard this. Everyone has that, you know, that next, uh, the great American novel, Waiting to Get Out. Uh, presumably, uh, people in other countries don't have the next great American novel. Um, but, you know, everyone wants to, everyone has these dreams. It's very common to, to, to write a book. And there are a lot of different reasons people want to write books. Uh, some want to connect with other people emotionally, uh, to tell a story that uh, reflects on something that is important to them. Other people write books to connect with others intellectually. So for example, um, uh, I, I'm working on writing science fiction and um, I have interesting stories I want to tell. My beginning Ubuntu book, I want to connect with people intellectually. I want to help people who uh, want to use Ubuntu but don't know where to begin. I want to give them a nice, good, solid start. And those are both valid uh, reasons to, to want to publish. And it's, it's something... Um, you know, a lot of people who want to write a book sort of struggle with this question. Well, well why, why should I write and publish a book? Um, humans, as far as we know, are the only creatures, the only animals on Earth who can tell stories that have no, no pre-existing factual basis. So when we watch Star Trek, for example, there are no Vulcans or Klingons or Romulans or Cardassians. <laughs> Somebody made that up. Um, you know, we have all sorts of different uh, uh, stories that, that uh, if you look back at early writing, uh, early books, um, everything, even the fairy tales, the King Arthur legend, for example, uh, are written as though they happened. Um, nowadays, fiction can be enjoyed just just for its own sake. It was an interesting sort of evolution in, 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 in writing. Um, but, um, you know, f for as intelligent as, say, dolphins and other greater apes and so on are, we're the only ones who tell stories. It's something uniquely human. And as far as we know, it's something unique in the entire known universe. Um, probably, probably not if you look hard enough, but um, I th would suggest that we don't have to waste our time worrying about why we want to tell a story. Uh, it's a natural human instinct. We're all natural storytellers. Um, other reasons to publish a book. Everyone wants to become, of course, uh, famous. Everyone wants to uh, get their riches, uh, become a bestseller. Um, these are far less likely to actually happen, um, although I do know a lot of, uh, I know, uh, about a hundred, I have a group of about a hundred people, it's a private author group, and I'm a sort of a technical consultant, and they're writing uh, mostly romance, some sci-fi, and other things, they're self-publishing. Some of them, about five of them are making um, over $20,000 a month uh, doing this, and so uh, none of them are bestsellers, but they keep writing and writing, and they all sell. So um, you can definitely make money in this, um, but if you want to be the next um, J.K. Rowling or Stephen King uh, or Michael Crichton, uh, that probably won't happen. But um, uh, fame and fortune are still another reason why people choose to publish. Now, there are two different ways of publishing. And uh, so, of course, there's traditional publishing, which has been around for a very, very long time. Um, we call it traditional publishing. Now, before that, if you wanted to write a book, um, you took some vellum and you uh, took a ink, a quill, and you started uh, writing. And if you wanted to publish, um, basically, you couldn't. Uh, you either wrote a lot or you got scribes to who were copyists. Um, in around 1440, the printing press was invented uh, in Germany. And the, um, so for the last 575 years, we've had this traditional publishing. And um, we all know how that works. We've all been to bookstores. Um, so that's what people usually think of when they talk about getting published. Uh, there's also self-publishing. And that really started uh, with the advent of, of um, uh, mimeographs and copy machines. And so in the early days, in the 60s and the 70s especially, it really started as uh, fanzines, uh, you know, where you could, you could write or typewrite something and get it copied and send it off to people. Uh, and of course, um, especially in the 70s, the 80s, uh, the rise of vanity presses came where you could pay someone uh, maybe about $5,000 to print 
you know, uh, 500 copies of your book, and then they sat in your garage, and you could try and sell them to bookstores uh, on consignment, or you'd sell them out of the trunk of your car. Um, and that was a very expensive way of, of going around things. And so self-publishing sort of ended up with a, a stigma um, that it wasn't professional. It was what you did if you couldn't get a publishing contract. But in the last 10 years, that's really changed. And what, what has actually changed is the internet. Now with websites, uh, everyone having websites and access to the internet, uh, and uh, dedicated ebook readers like uh, the Amazon Kindle uh, or the, the Nook Reader, uh, ebooks have really exploded. And so uh, now you can, you can write a story, and a day later, two days later, it can be online for people to, to buy. And although it takes longer than a day, you maybe take a couple weeks, but if you do all the right steps, your book can be indistinguishable from a professionally published book by a traditional publisher. So um, in especially the last two, three years, self-publishing has really lost a lot of that stigma uh, that it, it acquired from years of vanity presses and, and sort of predatory, uh, I think, um, uh, practices by people who weren't really publishers that were uh, author service, author marketing services. So I'm going to walk through the steps for each of these different routes to, to publishing. So first is traditional publishing. Now this first step, and it sounds kind of silly, but I'm going to say it anyway, the first step to, to traditional publishing a story is to write the story. That's step one, you've got to write the story. Uh, in the traditional publishing world, you actually write the entire manuscript and, and have it completed and finished and, and, and edited and polished a little bit, not, not your first draft. And you take that story and you submit it to uh, agents and or publishers. And uh, the difference is if you're writing nonfiction, you don't actually write the book. First, you write a proposal, uh, which is, this is the book I'm going to write. Um, this is the table of contents. You know, these, this is the chapters and the subjects, what I'm going to talk about. And probably, this is why I'm qualified to write this book. Um, publishers like to hear that too. Um, but you'll actually write the proposal, and it'll be accepted, and then, then you uh, get the advance, and you, you write based on that. But for fiction, it's completely different. For fiction, you actually write the book first. And so um, typically, in the fiction world, you submit your manuscript to agents and find an agent uh, that will represent you to, to publishers. And so once you have that, an agent, your agent takes your manuscript, submits it to publishers, uh, gets offers, finds they, they know all the publishers, they have contacts, they uh, see if they can get someone to they say, look, I've, this isn't someone off the street. I've read this. I think it will sell. They find a, a publisher uh, who's interested. And the publisher sends, this is what we're willing to pay. Here's a contract. And then your agent helps you look at the contract. And, um, and, and so your contract is going to be really lousy when you first get it. Uh, and your agent's going to help you strike that clause, uh, add this in here, and, and, and fine tune that. So uh, even if you were to submit directly to a publisher uh, and you got a contract, you still want to either find an agent or uh, more and more common these days is to hire a, an IP uh, rights attorney and have them help you make a contract that's going to be actually beneficial to you, not one-sided for the publisher. Um, boilerplate contracts are just always one-sided. That's how that works. It's a start. Once you have the contract, uh, then you then you finish the manuscript. There's some editing. You'll have input in, and the uh, the publisher uh, hires illustrators, hires the cover artist, hires the layout, the interior layout design, uh, does the cover. Um, you'll say yes or no, but you won't have a lot of input. Say so you won't get to say, I want this picture on my cover. It's that they handle that. They handle the entire publishing process from then on. Um, so when you traditionally publish, you write the book, you submit it to an agent, you get representation, you get the contract, and then you're done. Your publisher handles everything else. So for self-publishing, you still have to do all these steps. So the first step is still write a book. But now you're the publisher. So then you have to do all those steps. So the next step, of course, once you write the book and you've gone through it a couple times and revised it and you're happy with it, then you can hire uh, editors. Uh, there are different types of editors, actually. So first you'll get a uh, what's called a developmental editor. And they'll read the book and check the story out, make sure there's a, a beginning and a, you know, uh, if you've ever seen the, the plot for a perfect, uh, structure for a perfect plot, uh, you have the, uh, the beginning and everything's fine, and then you have the uh, crisis and the call to action, and then the hero's journey, and then you have the conflict and the resolution, the, the climax, and so on. So they'll make sure that the, the plot arcs and has the right shape, the characters are consistent, that uh, uh, you know the 
grouchy old uh, mentor, for example, uh, is grouchy the entire way through and not, you're not, you know, uh, bipolar, happy some days and ha you know, not otherwise. They help you smooth that out. You'll go back and do revisions. You might have beta readers uh, that, that give you feedback um, as you're rewriting. And then the very, very last step, you'll hire a copy editor or, or a line editor uh, that's going to go through and check all your punctuation and grammar because you don't want to do that on, the, on your first draft. You're going to be rewriting. And if, if anyone here knows, especially if you've done any programming or configuration file changes, you change a little bit and you can introduce all kinds of errors in anything you've changed. Um, so you definitely have well, so you definitely have more, more work to do then. So you want to do the, the proofreading at your last step. Once you've done all that and you have the book ready to go and it's nice and polished, then you need to cover or you hire a cover designer. And uh, well, two things, um, a layout designer first. I should have reversed that in my slides. Maybe we'll fix that for uh, when they go up uh, online. Um, so the layout designer lays out the interior. If you're doing print uh, book, you'll, you'll have uh, someone who does the interior. Uh, so for example, um, uh, we've all seen books. And we know on the first chapter, the first chapter always starts on an odd page. It always starts on the right-hand side, almost always. Uh, it has what's called a drop folio. So we have the header, and then the, the text starts not on the next line. It usually drops a little bit. First paragraph after the chapter section is not indented. Um, you have little headers saying things on each page, but not on the initial page. Those are all details that you could learn, um, but it, because it makes your book look really professional if everything's great, and it looks really unprofessional if there's headers on every single page. Uh, so these are things you can learn, but you could also spend your time writing and hire a designer who, who's an expert in this uh, and do all that yourself. So it, it, it's rather than doing it all yourself. So you can, you can have them do the work. And um, once you have the interior, t interior designed, whether it's an e-book or a print book, and you might have to have two editors for one for each, then you have hire a cover designer. That has to be the last step because when you do a cover, and I'll show you, um, I'll show you an example of what a cover looks like for a print book later. An ebook is just a front cover. A print book, of course, is cover, the spine, and the back. And depending on the size of your book and the uh, thickness of the book, how many pages, that changes the width of the spine and the dimensions of the cover. So uh, you can definitely do this on your own. Um, uh, You'll see a cover I designed uh, for a, a private client, so you'll see exactly why you should hire a professional as opposed to like me, but do it on your, on your own. But um, uh, the cover really needs to be one of the last things. If you're writing an ebook and you're not going to go to print um, for some reason, uh, sometimes a cover can be inspirational. You can look at it when, you're, you, know, uh, when you have writer's block, um, but normally it's, it's later on. Uh, I don't believe in writer's block, by the way. Um, uh, you know, coal miners don't get coal miners block. Um, sometimes writing is just hard work and you have to keep doing it. Um, but a cover can be inspirational anyway. And of course, your last step is you need to publish the book. And so uh, whether that's going to libraries and bookstores or online uh, storefronts, uh, that's your job all of a sudden. So um, there are a lot of different ways you can do that, and I'll, I'll mention some of them a little bit later. So before we go on to the fun stuff, uh, of course, um, why publish a book? Well. You may not publish it to make money, but money doesn't hurt. So let's talk about royalties. The way this works in traditional publishing is that um, your publisher, you sign the contract, and one of the really uh, good big perks is that the publisher pays what's called an advance on royalty. So your publisher, aside from for paying uh, for all the other stuff that it takes to publish your book, they pay you to write the book. Now, they don't just pay you to write the book what they do is that they're going to sell the book and they're going to keep most of the money. So what they're going to do is they're going to, uh, it's, it's like a loan, they pay you to or an advance to write the book and then when your book starts selling you don't see any money until you've earned out uh, that advance. So um, uh, the advance varies from publisher to publisher and how, what your experience is. So Stephen King gets a larger advance than I do, for example. Uh, he's been publishing a little bit longer. and. Um, the, uh, the trick is, it's, it's, it's always different. There's usually some room for negotiation. Um, so my, normally, authors don't like to talk about this too much. Now, my contract with A-Press, A-Press has a standard uh, contract template on their website, uh, so I'm happy to talk about this. Um, so my advance uh, was $1,000, and um, normally the way that works is um, they say you get, for fiction, so you get like $5,000 or $3,000, and you get, um, a third on signing, you sign the contract. You get a third when um, 
Usually it depends, could be like when half the manuscript is done, you turn in the manuscript, you get another third, and when it goes to print is on, on shelves, you get, you get the last third. Um, the way it worked for me was that, um, uh, uh, so I start writing, and then uh, uh, when, I, when one third of my manuscript is submitted and approved and locked in, then that triggers one third royalty, and then it's two thirds, and then 100%. I get that royalty. So, um, um, so I got a thousand dollars. They offer the contract. Here's the contract. We'd like to offer you a thousand dollar advance, and um, it's always pays to negotiate. So, uh, negotiation negotiation was pretty simple. I told them I thought they should offer me three times what they offered. They wrote back and told me they thought it didn't matter what I thought. So, um, <laughs> negotiation was pretty pretty simple. <laughs> um, they. My editor, uh, who uh, might be watching this, um, my editor actually was out super fantastic and very, very kind. Uh, and she just explained that this was our sta their standard, standard package and it was, that's what it was. Um, now, as it turned out, I happened to like every other single thing about the contract, um, except rights reversion was a little less solidly specified. But it's a tech book and in five years it's not going to matter anymore. So I, I said, well, the, my actual royalty um, starts really high and I'm, I'm happy with everything else right there without negotiation, so I, I signed it. But, um, and the book's almost done. So um, there's always room for negotiation. If you're writing fiction, uh, if you do go to uh, traditional publishing, you're not going to, if they say, here's a contract, it's not take it or leave it. It's never take it or leave it. They expect you to negotiate. They expect you to get an agent. Sometimes new authors are afraid to negotiate for their first book. But if you negotiate a really bad contract uh, on your first time, if you do no negotiation and you just sign it, that publisher is never going to want to go. They they know that they can. You're not going to give them a hard sell, so they know they can take advantage of the rest of the time. So, don't be afraid to negotiate. It's just the way they do business, and they will give you a bad a bad bad contract. So, um, uh, you know, make sure you you don't just sign the first thing you see. Um, so, as far as royalties go, in traditional publishing, um, your publisher pays you a royalty for books sold. So. Um, your publisher pays you an advance on royalties that you get before the book's even um, gone to press and before they sell a single copy. So normally uh, a publisher will sell things um, for about half off the list price. So for example, my book is uh, has a list price of $49.99, so it's $50. And they're probably going to sell that for about $25 to bookstores. Um, sometimes Amazon gets a deep discount, which is uh, more like 65%. So Let's say they sell to Amazon for 20, 25 bucks. Um, so my royalty is, um, uh, for fiction, it usually is between 7.5% uh, to begin with. And then as you sell more copies, there are levels that steps up, uh, usually up to about 15% or so. Uh, my royalty starts out uh, 10% and uh, goes up pretty quickly to uh, 15. Eventually, it can go up to 20. I don't think I'll sell that many books, um, although I don't really know yet. Um, that's a pretty high th threshold, though. But um, for a fifty-dollar book, the publisher will get about, say, twenty-five dollars. Uh, we can assume, and of that, I get ten percent. So for the first four or five hundred books, until my my royalty jumps to twelve and a half percent, I'm going to get about anywhere between two dollars to two two dollars and fifty cents per book off that fifty-dollar book, which doesn't sound like a, a super good deal. Um, but I didn't have to worry about layout, I didn't have to worry about editing, didn't have to worry about, um, they, I was able to name a friend as a tech reviewer and he's being paid handsomely uh, for that. Um, that wasn't the standard contract, so I don't want to say how much, but it's almost as much as I'm making in the advance. I'm, I'm really jealous. I told him, uh, I, I asked him, by the way, what are they paying you? Uh, and he told me, I said, oh, I should be my own tech reviewer. <laughs> tell them, tell them you quit. Um, so. You know, uh, and they're paying all this without having made a cent off of me. They they like the proposal. They're taking a chance. So um, that that's their justification for for taking so much. Um, uh, now, when you the other thing is when you uh, traditionally publish, I don't have an agent. Uh, I'm going direct with the publisher uh, because I felt usually I recommend not doing this, but I felt I had enough experience. It was a good idea. Uh, it's a little less risky sometimes in nonfiction, but in fiction you have to have an agent, someone representing you, and so. Um, that agent um, actually uh, takes 15%, it can be as low as 10, you negotiate, but if you're your first time author, 15% of everything you make the, author, or the agent gets. 
because they represented you. So they, they found a publisher who, wanted, who loved you, they found a publisher who wanted to sell your story, they can sell the most books, wants to pay you the biggest advance, because they get a cut of that too. Um, they, they worked hard to get you the most money, the most favorable terms in your contract, because they get a percentage of what you make. That puts you on the same team. Um, so what happens is that um, your publisher collects the money from the bookstores, sends the check to your agent, and then your agent sends you a check minus their 10%. Um, so that's how it works in traditional publishing. Um, Self-publishing, it's completely different. You're the publisher, so you get 100% of the net profits. Um, every storefront's different, but let's take Amazon, for example, since they're the largest uh, uh, online uh, bookstore. Uh, so um, if you take a book, so if you sell a book on, uh, Kim, through Kindle Direct Publishing, and you write a book and say, uh, Two ninety nine, for example, for the book. It's a pamphlet or something, a, a little self help book, or it's your first book, so it's a little, little less expensive. Uh, you'll make uh, seventy five percent of uh, of the net proceeds. So every time a book sells for two dollars and ninety nine cents, you get two dollars and eight cents, which is uh, pretty good because that's uh, that's quite a lot more. It's four times more than you would get from a traditional publisher who who wouldn't sell at two ninety nine anyway. Um, so uh, so it's, it's, it, you make money really fast self-publishing. Now, as far as print books go, uh, you have to get everything printed, you have to deal with the print, the layout, and so on. The best way to do that is to use a print-on-demand service. The days of paying for 5,000 copies of a book and selling them out of the trunk of your car um, are, are long gone. So you can create a, a, a layout and, and put together a print book and upload it to, say, CreateSpace, which is also owned by Amazon. Uh, and when someone orders a book, takes about two days, they, they actually send it out, they print it, and then they ship it out for you. You don't have to deal with warehousing, shipping, payment collection, anything like that. It's all done on demand. And so uh, if you took a, a tech book that's maybe, uh, say, uh, 8 by 11, uh, 300 pages, uh, black and white, that book through CreateSpace is going to cost about $10.50 to print. So say you, say you, uh, you sell for $25, you get to keep the rest, so you're making about $14 per book. Uh, if you have a, a little fiction book, a 200-page pocket novel, that's you know the new standard five by eight, um, that's going to cost. Um, um, you know, I don't have the cost on here for some reason. I don't know why. Um, say you sell for 7.99, which is the standard standard uh, standard price. Uh, it's going to you're going to get a, a dollar fifty for each book that sells. It cost about um, just under six dollars to uh, under um, about six fifty to. To, to publish that book, so or to print the book, so um, you'll you'll figure out. CreateSpace will tell you what it's going to cost. It's a standardized rate, and then you can set your royalty, and then they'll sell, you know, they'll sell that way. So um, really easy, really simple. From there, the print books, uh, Amazon distributes, or CreateSpace distributes to Amazon. It can distribute wider, um, but you can go there uh, uh, if you. Um, so so getting a print book is super easy. An ebook is just like that. It's all pure profit. And there are companies that handle the print book as well, so that's that's no big deal. So to recap, um, traditional publishing, you get teams of uh, experts working on your book, you get access to bookstores and libraries, but you get very, very little of the royalty of, of the retail sell. Uh, for self-publishing, you have to find and hire your own team, um, but you get to create, you get to keep your own creative control, uh, handle your own, uh, create, keep your own rights, uh, handle your own marketing, and so uh, there, are, so you get to keep, say, seventy percent of what you make, but you have to do all the work yourself. So um, every book can be different. Um, I don't, I can't imagine ever traditionally publishing fiction. I can't imagine any world under which that makes any sense for me, monetary wise. Um, but for uh, for nonfiction, for this first reference book, uh, I think that having an actual book on shelves that you can pick up and leaf through for a tech reference book is is much more valuable. And having that experienced team at A Press help me through each step of creation was invaluable. So, um, and they had a really fair contract. So I'm super, super happy with the deal I, I, I made with them. And I wouldn't do the same thing for fiction, for example. So when you publish, um, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, you want to look at each, indi each, indi each individual book is different. So like I traditionally publish with this book and I would self-publish with this other, which makes me a hybrid author. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that either. So, so feel free to do the thing that makes the most sense for each individual title. Uh, but the most important thing is that uh, in traditional publishing, all money flows toward the author. 
Um, you do not pay other people to publish your book. If you're self-publishing, you're publishing your book, and you're going to pay someone for layout, pay for editing. You want to pay what it's worth. But if you're traditionally publishing, you don't pay agents submission fees. You don't pay agents reading fees. You don't pay publish. You don't pay anyone anything. That's a scam. So that's very very important. If you're getting 10% of royalties. Uh, if basically if you're getting if you're getting 3% of the cover price of your book, they they get their money. You don't want to give them any more money. Um, so be very very careful. So when it's time to write, um, we have tools at our, at our uh, disposal. Now writing itself, it's easy to get. Um, you used to, have, used to have a typewriter. You type everything. And then Max came along in 1984. And suddenly you had all these great fonts and font sizes and all kinds of margins. And, and people could play with things. And productivity dropped in offices worldwide because people were playing with the formatting tools. And you can do the exact same thing. You say, well, I'm writing a book. So uh, what I want to do is I want to take the book. And I want to, uh, well, you know, you have your page size. I want to know what the page count's going to be. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change the page size down here and change the margins. And you know, uh, what you may not know when you read a book is that the interior margins on the inside of the, of the page um, are larger because where the binding is, you know, you don't see the whole page. So you can tweak that. You can waste weeks planning the format, formatting your book. Do not do that. The only one thing you want to do is so you want to have a word processing software. And what word processing software does, what it was made to do, was process words. All the other stuff you can do. Uh, back in the 80s, there was word processing software. There's desktop publishing software. They were completely separate. Now it's so easy to, um, you know, you wouldn't spend forever playing with, with uh, fonts in WordPerfect for DOS because you wouldn't see them. Don't get caught in this trap. You want to work on your content. The most important thing you can do for your book is write the actual content. The presentation doesn't matter. There are a few different reasons. Uh, the most important is that you can hire someone to make it look pretty later, but um, only if you've written the book. So uh, focus on writing, not on styles, non formatting. Uh, if you're in LibreOffice, you could set an initial first line indent uh, and paragraph spacing just to be more comfortable. There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe a heading style, the end. Heading, default paragraph font, the end. Don't, don't play with this. Um, so you can lose, use LibreOffice. Um, there's a really, really nice minimalistic word processor called uh, FocusWriter that kind of removes everything off the screen and is, is sort of really pretty. So I, I can also recommend that. But uh, other than that, you want to keep things simple. You can even use your favorite text editor because formatting, like I said, is not important at this stage. Whatever gets words onto the screen, onto your disk, uh, that's what matters. So um, I happen to be working now. I only use Ubuntu at home. Uh, I do have Windows 10 so that I can boot into uh, Windows and play Skyrim occasionally. Uh, that's my excuse. I haven't played Skyrim in probably two years. So it's uh, now that my book is almost finished, I might have a chance to again. But uh, I've been busy. So uh, I don't actually, I have LibreOffice installed on Windows, but I don't actually do any, any appreciable work in Windows. It's just I'm not as efficient in it. Uh, I do everything in Ubuntu. So uh, I'm using LibreOffice Writer as my uh, word processor to write this book. And of course, uh, APRESS uh, actually isn't using LibreOffice. I know this will come as a shock to you. They're actually using Word uh, uh, 2010. So they gave me a bunch of Word templates. They gave me a big uh, uh, zip file with uh, like 30 fonts to install for their templates. And they, um, as we do uh, revisions, they turn on track changes. And I get Word documents with all these changes. So uh, this is how my publisher expected me to write. This is Word 2016. And there's the template and everything. And I have comments and so on. That's what they, ex that was, they expected me to write. But um, as it turns out, this is how I actually write. And so I've actually been using LibreOffice. And um, you can see a couple things. Now, you can't tell here it looks good, but the fonts actually uh, for the template aren't perfect. I think this screenshot, I, I had to go in and set up a font substitution. Um, the default font is uh, uh, Utopia. And of course, the font they gave me is called Utopia STD for Utopia Standard, uh, standard uh, width, uh, weight. And um, of course, that doesn't match. But it didn't match in Office either. Didn't match in Office 2013. Didn't off match in Office 2016. So. Uh, that doesn't matter. Now, the important thing, remember when I said it uh, formatting doesn't matter? They gave me these beautiful templates. Uh, after a heading, uh, there's a first paragraph style that gets rid of the indent. There's a cap uh, figure caption style and so on. And I do use the styles up here, actually. You can see I use styles. You can see the font doesn't match. Some italics didn't, couldn't find the font. 
but that doesn't really matter. Um, one, when I save it, and I, I save everything in ODT. First I did was open up the Word document, save as ODT, and I do all my work there. My last step before I upload it to their uh, SharePoint site is to save as uh, docx format. But uh, this does, and it looks mostly good. There's some formatting issues. When I get it back, it looks different. They've changed things. Doesn't matter because what they do is that they, they take everything, they uh, export everything into some XML-based type of thing, and they use the styles to run it through their processor. So no matter what it looks like here, it looks pretty good, not perfect. They, all this presentation information is basically thrown out. The only thing they keep are my styles. So the, they have a team of editors, and their job is to make sure I use the right style. So I, I know that a couple things I submitted, I'm about to go to revisions, and I've looked over the revisions. A couple times I've submitted things where I forgot to unindent the first font, or the first paragraph. It doesn't matter. Uh, in fact, they specifically said they didn't want me to worry about any of this. Like, do this if you can. If it's a hassle, just write it down. They have a team that makes sure that all of the formatting, all the styles are applied correctly. So while I try to do that, it helps me out, helps them out a little. Uh, this, so it's so someone's, some poor person's job to make sure to check everything. Even, even though it looks good, they still have to check. Um, you know, the <laughs> headers, for example, I changed the header on the first uh, <laughs> header, and this still says, this is still the template. It didn't repeat. It's not my job, I don't think, to change the header on every single page. Uh, what am I paying them 90% of net royalties for, right? That's their job. Um, so they'll handle all of that, and it, it doesn't matter. So um, you don't have to worry too much about formatting. But the neat thing is that um, uh, my tools work with their tools. LibreOffice is perfectly capable of working with Word, and it wasn't a problem. So once you've actually submitted everything, then the next step is actually revision. And so um, LibreOffice makes this really, really easy. Uh, if you so, if they have uh, the other person has Word uh, or or LibreOffice, um, your editor will turn on track changes. They'll make their changes. They'll add in comments. You'll get it back. Everything will be marked up. And it'll be totally fine. Uh, there's no problem. LibreOffice lets you work with others, even if they're using Word. And of course, if you have an editor or a beta editor, if you prefer LibreOffice, they say, "Well, I don't have LibreOffice. I can't read these weird ODT uh, text files," which of course is a lie. ODT is an international format, and Word supported it for forever. Um, you can give your, your editor or your beta reader, you can give them LibreOffice. It's free software. You can say, here it is, here's this professional tool I'm using, uh, and they're all set. Um, your editor is, you're not going to find an editor who doesn't have Word, obviously, but uh, you may find beta readers that, that, that can't read this, and so you can give them LibreOffice, uh, and then they'll be really happy with you because you gave them this professional word processing, this Office suite, word processing spreadsheet. Uh, this is on LibreOffice and Press. You know, presentation software, uh, but then you are responsible for tech support for anything that ever goes wrong on the computer ever because uh, it happened right after you gave them that Libra Office program, right? <laughs> so never mind that they're downloading music from all those. Yeah, 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 yeah. Never mind everything else they've done, right? So <laughs> that's how that goes. Um, but not only not only is LibreOffice, not only does this free software product give you a perfect professional enterprise grade tool, it gives you the right to give that tool to others. So it actually. Um, so I, I didn't give A-Press a link to the LibreOffice uh, website to download anything. Uh, actually, I, they said, we want, here's our templates. We want you to do it in Word. I said, uh, I'm going to be using LibreOffice unless it causes a problem later on in revision. Then I'm happy to switch. Um, for my personal use, I, I use free software whenever possible. Um, I'll, I'll go without some features if I have to. It's less and less common nowadays that I have to. But um, if I'm being paid to do something, I use the tool they want me to, right? So um, uh, it was really gracious of them to say, great, no problem, uh, we'll let you know if something comes up. And they've had no problem. In fact, when I, when I had a, a conference call with them to uh, finalize the last steps, they said they've had no problem. Everything looks good. So, um, uh, so LibreOffice is really great. Now, some of us are technical here, and you may be thinking, well, I know. Um, you know, I have Bazaar, I have Subversion, I have uh, Git. I'll just use source control, right? Um, you can use source control. I don't actually recommend, I, I, don't, I recommend against it. Uh, if you're doing academic work and you're writing in latex and everything's text-based, uh, absolutely. If for some reason you've decided that you wanted to be weird and write your book, your novel in markdown format, for example, that's again all text, okay, maybe. Uh, it's great for, for tracking changes, but what you don't get from that is uh, if I send a beta reader or an editor a Word document, they can make comments and annotate it and I can track changes. Uh, and so while your, your version control system will track changes, it can't handle comments. You don't want them committing uh, 
what's that, a commit message for every single every single change they make. That's not how that works. So um, version control software, so source control probably isn't a good fit, even though we immediately think of it. Uh, probably LibreOffice would be your best bet. Um, but I mean, it's your book, so it's up to you. Uh, here's an example of revising the LibreOffice. This is an actual page from my book. Um, I thought when I was just describing wine, um, I would have, um, uh, what's the captions here? So with wine, you can put uh, Isle Riot Solitaire and Windows Solitaire side by side uh, against each other, have them fight it out, right? Um, so here's the thing. So um, um, my editor, they have standards and they want me to reference figures, uh, illustrations of the book before they appear. So every single one of my first three chapters is like, please reference the figure before the, before the illustration. Please re reference the figure in the text before the illustration. Which is good, that's their job, and the book will be consistent then, right? Um, and then, of course, my tech uh, reviewer said, well, you know, this might be confusing. Um, like, you had to, like, I know that you went to your Windows install and you pulled Solitaire out of there. Uh, you went and found uh, the system.32 and found sol, sol.exe and pulled it out for this. They might see this, and because Wine comes with Notepad, which is a, a Windows text editor, it's not the Notepad, called the same thing. They might also look for Windows Solitaire. So this might be confusing. And so, um, so this, please add a reference to this figure in the above text, and then here's, you know, you might want to, you might want to explain a little bit more and so on. Uh, along with, this is where they annotated, and there's, there's marks everywhere. And you can see that they went and fixed the header because I was too lazy to. Um, I did the first page so that they knew, knew I saw it and I didn't do the rest. Um, so it looks really beautiful and perfect, um, even though I'm using different <coughs> software than they are. Once you have everything written and revised, uh, the next step, of course, is the interior, interior layout. And there are a few ways to do this. Now, um, so you have LibreOffice, of course. If you've written everything in LibreOffice, it is a word processing program, but it does have a, a lot of nice uh, tools for styling and uh, styles and page formatting. And you can use that. Um, basically, uh, you want to make sure that everything's content's all finished and locked down, because if you do layouts and you get everything flowing, uh, and you add a paragraph here or there, or a picture, you go and you have to change, you have to renumber all the images. That happened to me. Uh, unfortunately, I had to go in and renumber uh, 30 images because I added two in the beginning. Um, uh, you, um, you might change the text flow. You, you don't want to, if you're hiring someone, especially if you're hiring someone, you don't want to have them do all the work, and then you say, oh, hey, I made some changes. Uh, can you redo, redo all that work again? They will charge you again if they are smart. Um, you get little revisions here and there, but if you change a bunch of text and they have to do tons of extra work, uh, expect that you're going to have to pay them again, which is only fair because they might have to redo a substantial por portion of the work from scratch. Um, you can use LibreOffice, and in fact, if you're if you're publishing for CreateSpace, uh, that's actually pretty plausible. Um, you can uh, you uh, CreateSpace wants a PDF, and so you can print directly to PDF in LibreOffice, and for a simple book, you're okay. Uh, Scribus is the actual uh, full desktop publishing solution uh, in Ubuntu and on, on the Linux desktop. And I think it's available, I know it's available for Mac, I think Windows as well. Uh, so I haven't used this myself. Uh, it's one of those things I want to get into and I will probably do this very shortly. Uh, my tech book I would have done in Scribus if I had done it myself and I decided to pay other people through a traditional publishing contract uh, to do that for me. Um, so. Uh, my first fiction books will probably be done, the print books will be done in LibreOffice because um, I can do a pretty good job with that. But very, very quickly, as soon as possible, I'm going to be learning Scribus. And that's, that handles all the page flow and everything else. Um, and so it's very important that, that uh, it goes back to the old days, you have your word processor where you write everything, you have a, your desktop publishing where you lay everything out. They're two separate things. If you've done web page development, you're familiar with this. Uh, and if you're doing ebooks, then you still need to do a little bit of layout. And while Amazon will take a Word document, you can upload it and you're all set. Uh, Sigil is actually a, an ebook editor um, that's really popular, really powerful. And I do all my ebooks, and when I do uh, ebook formatting for other people, um, uh, I actually use Sigil. And I make sure that all the chapters are in there, uh, the chapter breaks, I do a table of contents, I do all the metadata, so you're and you go to uh, go to table of contents in your ebook reader. You get a, a layout um, where you can tap it. You don't have to go to the table of contents page and click the hyperlinks. There is a table of contents page with hyperlinks, 
but at any point you can say go to your ebook leader will give you an outline. It's really nice and neat. So uh, Sigil lets you do all of that. And so this is an example of a print book I did. Um, this was a real project I actually was paid uh, pretty good money to do uh, for as a vanity project. And uh, so I Greeked all the text uh, because uh, it was a biography of, uh, of someone who uh, in the 1890s created a, a, a meat processing plant and it grew into a company that you would know and recognize today. And so um, I, did, I did anonymize this text, but it looked like this. So we see here, we have no headers anywhere at the, at the first page. We have the chapter title, the drop folio, uh, the first paragraph is indented, and so on. So um, this looks really nice and clean. And then on the interior pages, I have the headers, I have the page numbers, everything's laid out. Um, those are all, all those attention to detail, all the stuff I told you that you should probably hire someone else to do, well, they hired me and I, could, I got to sit there for about a week, do the research, and uh, and come up, make sure that this looked nice and professional. Uh, this was this is the actual PDF. Um, uh, this is what would have been uploaded, and uh, it looked really kind of nice. Um, so you can really make this look nice and neat. Um, I have you know different fonts, different font sizes, and so on. So this is exactly what it looked like on the page. Now, when it comes to eBooks, uh, you don't have a physical page. So um, this is uh, the beginning of the book Pay Me Bug by Christopher Wright. Uh, I had nothing to do with this except that I took my uh, copy I bought from Amazon and I converted it to EPUB and I, I threw it in here for the screenshot. Uh, Pay Me Bug is a license under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 license and therefore I am allowed to uh, have this excerpt here. Although he did uh, kindly give me uh, permission to reproduce this first page uh, in my book to demonstrate caliber. Uh, so uh, if he ever gets to watch this and sticks around to this uh, time point, because he's already self-published, thank you. Um, so this is Sigil. We have all our, all our chapters, our different uh, files. This is actually XHTML in an EPUB book. And all the formatting is actually done through CSS. So if you've done any web, web page stuff, you're all set. You'll also know that uh, it, what your formatting options are for EPUBs are pretty limited not just by the format itself, but also because uh, ebook readers tend to be very, very minimalistic uh, and widely vary in, the, in their capability. So a Kindle Fire tablet can do full screen pictures and all kinds of fancy stuff. Uh, a really old uh, e-ink Kindle reader, for example, uh, can't do colors, for example, it'll, it'll render everything grayscale, only has eight fonts on it, so uh, you, can, you can embed fonts, but it's not set up by default. So you wanna keep layout nice and simple. And this is an example of what that looks like. It looks like any, what you see is what you get, HTML editor you've ever used. Uh, and you're mostly still doing just standard formatting, some italics here, headers, and you're all done. Um, cover design is something you can do yourself, um, but you really probably should get someone else to do it for you. But uh, the same tools apply. You have GIMP for your photographic side. You have Inkscape for the text layout. And um, again, for ebooks, you're going to want a front cover only. And for a print book, you need a wraparound cover. So here's a template for a create space. This is a template for a 240 page uh, 6 by 9 book. And um, so this, I, I, uh, create space will give you a template. I wanted the barcode on here specifically, uh, I wanted to control that. So uh, I found a website that, that did create space templates. Uh, the size, of the, what's called the trim size, which is the size of the book, uh, mattered. The, uh, whether I used uh, white, pure white pages or cream white pages changes the thickness of the book. So I had to know, I had to have the, the interior layout completely locked down so I knew how many pages uh, that the book was going to be. Then I had to know what type of paper was being used in the book because I, otherwise the spine isn't the right width. So that's why uh, it's better, to, one, this should be done after everything is locked that down. Two, it's better to hire someone. But this is what it looks like. You have the front cover, the spine, the back. Uh, you have a bleed area in, in red. You can't put any, so the spine text, you couldn't put any, any spine text in the red area. When everything's uh, offset print and cut and put glued to the book, um, they don't guarantee exact precision, so you don't, you don't want the title of the spine to kind of wrap around the back of the book. That doesn't look professional at all. So this is basically what the book ended up looking like. Um, I did actually pay and license um, I actually spent more on this mock-up than I did on the original book. He had uh, photos, but um, he, uh, you know, obviously um, he wasn't selling the book. Uh, he he did a couple for the granddaughter of the uh, of the person, 
and uh, as a gift. And so he didn't need to worry about copyright clearance uh, for this presentation because it goes, on, it goes online. I had to spend twenty dollars on stock photos to get this up here. So uh, I actually have a good deal with the stock photo company, so I didn't I didn't spend anything. Spent uh, sixty cents, but uh, eighty cents. But uh, and you, that's something else you have to worry about is image clearance and where does that come from. So another good reason to hire someone. But you can see there's a there's the title, the, the cover image, you have a back, you have a pull quote, the summary of the book, you have a biography, author author uh, author portrait, um, the uh, barcode um, that has been a, spe a specific special format. So, so um, there's a lot there, and um, you probably want to contract that out. But it's pretty simple. You can, I did this completely. I don't think I did anything on this in Inkscape. I think I ended up doing this entire thing in GIMP. Uh, and it uploaded. It was fine. And he was very happy with the results, so I'm happy to say. So you definitely want to get a professional, but it can be done. Um, and when you get to the, the point where you want to publish the book, in traditional publishing, the publisher takes care of that step. You're done. Uh, for uh, for uh, self-publishing, course it's up to you if you are doing an ebook you upload your epub or your word doc and you're all set you fill in a form with metadata uh, data the title the author name the blurb some search keywords you set your prices you're done um, the best thing to do is to, uh, to for a print book is to use print on demand and so I would recommend looking into uh, Amazon's create space uh, Ingram spark is another one that uh, has a better chance of getting books they won't get your books into bookstores, but they'll catalog them so that you can, uh, one of your fans can go to a bookstore and order the book. Um, CreateSpace can do that too for a little bit of extra money, but um, a lot of bookstores um, are boycott Amazon and will not order from CreateSpace. So there's a little bit of a, but CreateSpace is a much better bargain. So you're gonna wanna look at that. Lulu Press is another, uh, another uh, uh, they, they print lots of things, but they also print, uh, uh, books and that's also print on demand, and um, they do pretty good quality books too. So Create Space, Ingram Spark, and Lulu Press are good starts uh, for uh, you know if you want to self-publish uh, print books. The best thing of all, you provide you you create the PDF, you upload it, you create the cover, you upload that it's also a PDF, and you pay no money um, at all. And then you can buy th uh, books for cost for your own author copies. You decide the market for the price. They handle. Uh, they handle the, um, the payment processing, they handle the sales, the web page, the payment processing, the refunds, the processor fees, the shipping, the printing. They do all that uh, for no money up front. So um, again, you don't want to pay anyone to, to, to print your books most of the time. Publish an ebook, like I said, Word or EPUB works. Um, there are lots of different places you can publish ebooks. Amazon is the biggest uh, publisher. Um, you have uh, Nook Press is the, probably the second biggest. Uh, Smashwords has their own store, they're popular, and they can distribute to other uh, retailers as well. Um, iTunes, uh, of course, is really, really big. And Google Play uh, Books is also um, uh, an up-and-coming uh, bookstore that's, uh, that's a little hit or miss. I've seen people um, have a lot of success and have no success, so, um, you know, it depends. Um, if you're not going uh, exclusive with Amazon, because there are some benefits for that, then you, you probably want to publish wide. And you're going to want to uh, research all of these different uh, places. And uh, the slides will be available um, in the download link uh, uh, above the comments below this video. Um, so you'll be able to, uh, to take a look at these slides and get that list. Um, personally, I, I'm a big fan of Kindle and KDP Select, which puts my book in Kindle Unlimited, which is a, uh, a free subscription service uh, where people, Kindle Unlimited subscribers can download my book for free and I get paid uh, based on the percentage of the book they read. Um, and I think for getting market that's really good, uh, other people like to go wide. They don't like to be exclusive. So um, there are a lot of different uh, different options there. But the actual publishing is easy. It's a web form, title, subtitle, author name. Uh, you can put more than one contributor if you have them. Description, keywords, upload your files, you're done. There's a review process. In uh, less than a day, sometimes, your book can be online, ready to buy. So the last thing I want to mention is digital rights management. So when you upload to Amazon, there's a check mark whether you want, uh, or it might be a radio button, whether or not you want to enable DRM. By default, it's off. So uh, if you're traditionally published, they have the, the publisher has the final say on your ebook, e obviously, because they handle that. You've given them the publishing rights. It's out of your hands. You sign those rights to them. So you don't have a good say. You might be able to mention if you have a preference, but usually the user, they don't. Um, most publishers do use DRM. 
uh, Tor books, I think, stopped using DRM and their sales went up. Uh, I would like to say that, um, so if you're self-publishing, you have, you have the control. So um, I don't think DRM is helpful for self-published books or eBooks in general. Uh, for one thing, they make the book less valuable. Um, the most important thing is that DRM only affects paying customers. The only people affected by DRM is to is are people. And we know that d digital rights management is a copy a copy prevention technology uh, to keep people from making unauthorized copies of your books. Um, so the only people who are affected by this are people who went out and bought your book, because if somebody takes your book and strips the DRM and puts it online on a on a, a, a download site, well they strip the DRM. Anyone who steals your book or pirates it, it's not theft. They don't deprive you of anything. But uh, anyone who takes your book and downloads it illegally is not affected by DRM. It's already been stripped out. It has no, no impact on them, whatever. They get a better product because they don't have to worry about incompatibility. They don't have to worry about encryption schemes. They don't have to worry about uh, if they want to print a passage, they can do that. DRM doesn't stop them. Um, only people who are legit customers who loved your book enough to pay money for it are affected by this. So um, I recommend, um, it can be automatically stripped. There's a, there's a, a plugin actually for Caliber. Um, you type in your serial number on your Kindle so when you plug your Kindle in and it automatically syncs your books over, uh, the plug will automatically strip the DRM. What DRM does is that if, uh, if one of your readers buys your book uh, from Nook Press, from Barnes & Noble, and they, uh, they, they drop their Nook, the screen cracks, they decide, well, I'm gonna get a Kindle. The only thing DRM does is make them have to buy your book a second time for Kindle, unless they strip it, unless you give them that hassle. So I would recommend that DRM, um, Digital rights management I like to think of as digital restrictions management. And I would definitely recommend that you just leave it off. Um, uh, most part of the books either aren't going to be sales in the first place, so they're not lost sales. And someone who buys, who, who downloads your book and likes it might say, this is pretty good. I'm going to go to Amazon and I'm going to see if he wrote anything more. And they might actually become customers. So I wouldn't stress out about this. Uh, it's very common for beginning authors to worry about sales and so on. Um, worry about the content, write the book get professionally uh, produced, and then, then you're all set. So um, that's my little speech there as far as um, you know DRM goes. Uh, other than that, that's pretty much it. So I'd like to go ahead and do questions. Yes? Yes. Finding agents and finding editors. Very good. So finding agents and finding editors. Um, so the trick is if you, if you get an agent and you traditionally publish, you don't have to find editors because uh, your publisher will hire editors and they'll, they'll handle the editing themselves. Uh, so that's, that's a great shortcut. Um, the way you find agents, and I'll talk about how to find agents, uh, how to find editors, but the way you find agents is that, um, well, if you write a book in a genre and you have a favorite author in the same genre, that the book's sort of similar, you can find out who the agent is. A lot of times it's on the copyright page. And you can solicit their agent. That's a great a great way to do it, and or, or you might say, you know, I love I love this book you published with so and so. I'm writing a similar book. Um, are you interested, or do you know other people might be interested? That can be a way in. Um, I think the service is called. See, I, I say as I, I want to self-publish, so I, I I haven't looked in this too too much uh, in detail in a long time since I decided want, so since I wanted to, I decided I wanted to self-publish. So it's been a couple of years. Duotrope I think is the service. Uh, that lists uh, publishers and agents, and uh, there's, I think there's reviews. And so you can find who they've represented, and you can use that to find out whether or not, um, you don't want to send a historical fiction uh, novel to someone who uh, publishes um, uh, you know, crime thrillers, or someone who publishes uh, Regency romance novels. You, know, you want to find someone who handles sci-fi, or whatever you're writing, you want someone who is interested in that, and excited because then when they go approach publishers, they're gonna be excited for that. They're going to know what the, who the publishers are. Um, publishers tend to specialize. So Duotrope is a great place to, uh, to start. Uh, you, if you have any friends who have uh, published, you can ask them. Uh, recommendations from an author are always kind of, so when you submit to an agent, your manuscript goes in what's called a slush pile, which means interns have to read it. And if they think they see something good, then an editor reads it, uh, an agent reads it. So um, uh, if you're, um, if you, your cover letter says, oh, hey, because um, you'll write a query letter when you submit your, your manuscript. If it says, uh, you know, um, 
my so and so that publishes you, uh, that you, whom you represent, has recommended me uh, your services to me, and I'd like to, you know, here's my book, and, it's, and you do the regular stuff. It's about this and so on. Uh, that moves your book all the way up to the top of the well, the slush pile. Um, but um, it might have an agent actually pull it and, and take a look at it, uh, if it's true that the person actually did refer you. Don't don't say, yeah, oh, my friend Stephen King said, uh, hey, he loved your work, and uh, he said I should submit to you. Right? That's not going to that's not going to be so helpful. Um, to find an editor is a little more tricky. There are a lot of online communities. Uh, that, uh, that cater to authors. So there's Kboards is probably the, uh, the easiest one. I think it's Kboards.com. Um, they tend to be a little temperamental sometimes. So I usually, I actually have, uh, I'm in a couple private groups and because they, the private groups tend to, are smaller and they, um, they're only relying on themselves. Um, they tend to collect information from other places. Plus they do experiments with Amazon. Mostly they write romance so they have a quick turnaround time. So they say, well, I, I price this novel at 99 cents to try out what happens. I price this one at 2.99. Then they'll compare sales, find out what happens. So I get most of my information from those groups. But Keyboards is a great place. And um, on all those groups, you can, you can um, sometimes there are editors who are there who are being helpful. Uh, Reddit.com has a great subreddit called um, writing. So it's reddit.com slash r slash writing. Uh, and I think three of the mods are there are editors. And they give fantastic advice. And um, so they're not there to sell their services. Um, so some, if occasionally someone asks, they say, well, PM me. I don't know if they're referring to other people, but, but there are editors there. Uh, and you can definitely ask, you know, uh, has anyone had uh, any luck with this? Um, there are places to find editors uh, and, and get reviews and, and, and do that. A lot of times editors will, you can submit like the first two pages in your manuscript and they'll, they'll edit it, send it back. You can see what they like. Uh, I do editing. I just got paid um, actually quite a lot of money. Uh, I did e-book e e formatting for someone. and. Um, they, they decide to write a novel, and their editor's busy, and they said, well, would you, uh, when you formatted, you've always sent back comments of anything you've caught while you're, after the edit's done, when you're doing the formatting, would you be interested in editing this? I said, absolutely. And they, they told me what they were going to pay, which was the other agent's rates, uh, editor's rates. I said, absolutely, Ab yes, I will. <laughs> um, for a 77,000 uh, word book, uh, I got $300. I think it'd be a little more than that's by word. Word we estimated at 75, and she finished writing at 77. So I got about 300, dollars uh, which is pretty good for 11, 12 hours worth of work. Uh, and probably by the time I get home, um, she, she'll turn, turn it around and she'll send it back to me for proofreading, which is another 150, which is isn't half bad at all. Um, that's just like punctuation and some things. And so I I went in, I put comments in, and um, I said, well, this is that's odd. So like this person, you know scream through clenched teeth. I mean, you can't scream through clenched teeth, for example, is, is a, a remark I did. Or uh, I said, you know, you have a British and American character, so the person's uh, remembering the love interest uh, as she, um, um, uh, how did it go? Oh, as she was stood in the kitchen by the, by the counter, you know, making dinner. I'm like, they, we don't, Americans don't say, as she, you know, stood by the counter, and that's, that's, that's Britishism, you want to change this for the American. Um, or they keep necking back beers, and I'm like, no, we don't, we don't I, I know what it means, but that's not what we say. She can say that, she's British, he can't say that, he's American. That thing's, and funny comments, I'd say, you know, this the character reminds me of, of uh, this character from this other series, and, or that seems like a weird, like, she seems really feisty, you know, for an old lady, like, is, are we going to see more of her? Because uh, that's kind of interesting, but, but draws attention to herself if she's not a major character. Or I'd say, you know, I, I'm waiting for this turn. This is this is obviously you're dancing around, you're writing around the, the the plot twist, but now it's been three chapters, and the main character knows, the secondary character knows. Now you're having a, a secondary, a background character kept talking, but you're dan you're not ever saying what it is. But the audience is the only one who doesn't know, and it's so like, you know, we're we're 75 percent through the book. When are they going to find out? And it was like saying 82. I think it was 80 81 percent through. I said so. Here's it's like, we better find out the next chapter, and then there was the next chapter with a perspective change. And then the next chapter at the end, the, and I said, all right, so I know what I said two chapters ago, it better be the next chapter, but uh, the pacing was actually good, and uh, this is actually plausible, and as a tech person, this email didn't send or whatever, uh, that would, uh, actually would be plausible. So um, it's a good twist, it makes sense, it's technically plausible, and I didn't see it coming, and, and good job. So she wrote back uh, yesterday and said, that, um, thanks for the edit, thanks for the quick turnaround time. Uh, she had a deadline. And um, she's loving my comments. So um, 
it's really important to find, um, we worked together before, so I'm really joking in my comments, um, in between giving you know, good advice. Every so often I'll say, well, this is kind of funny, or isn't that weird, or what could they be thinking? So, um, uh, so uh, you want to make sure you have a good fit with an editor because they're going to be working with you to, to polish your creative vision. So um, a little bit of that is searching around and getting maybe uh, recommendations, and a little bit is just testing out different editors as well. I'm sorry, that went to kind of a story time thing, but uh, uh, I'm an author, so what can I say? I, I bought Catcher in the Rye when I lived in Japan. Mm -hmm. It was published in London, and they changed things. That happens, well, uh, you know, uh, who can tell me the f name, the title of the first Harry Potter book? A subtitle, the first Harry Potter book. Yes, yeah. call it out. Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Good. Uh, if you go to the bookstore now, you'll see Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. The original title of the book was the Philosopher's Stone, which is an actual object in a kind of a alchemical uh, kind of mytho mythology from the Middle Ages. To make gold. Um, right, to make gold. Uh, to, I think it granted the person immortality, I think was a thing. Um, so when J.K. Rowling, when Scholastic uh, published the book here, they're like, you know, that's so nerdy and geeky. No one's going to know what that is, and they're going to say, this is a book for nerds. And so we're going to call it Sorcerer's Stone. Sorcerers are exciting, right? And so they changed the title of the book because it was called localization. And of course, they also changed, uh, instead of jumpers, uh, they changed it to jackets, you know, lorries and lists and petrol to gas. It's, you know, there are lots of good things they did, but the title, I'm not, I don't present, I think, I think they underestimated kids today. Spelling. But it, it, yeah, it didn't, didn't hurt the movie or the book sell, so, you know. Uh, and spelling and so on. Um, Who knows what a K E R B or a G A O L is? There's that too. Um, my author, I, I published, actually um, went, changed spelling, changed the English dialect uh, and the spelling of the text based on the point of view character, which I said, I, I, we, we should did that before. I said that I love the idea. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but um, you know, I like it. And so she said she might put a wording in the beginning of the book, and it worked out really well, actually. It came out really nice. Now, LibreOffice, she, she, I think I mentioned this before because I had to do it myself. You can mark certain sections of text as being in different languages. And you can actually mark certain text as being English, English US and certain as English UK. And she did it for me because I would have otherwise. And that means that when I sat down, uh, the spell checker changed from American English and British English based on the point of view character. Um, I do that when I'm writing, so when I'm writing in German, for example, I trust me, I need all the help I can, so I always do that. Um, and it was really nice, but even English to English, she was able to do that. You can mark little words or sentences as being a different language, and it handles that, so that's, that's pretty cool. Yes? To do that in LibreOffice, do you need both locales installed? To do that in LibreOffice, so um, yes, you do need both locales installed. I don't know how that works in, um, in uh, I don't know how that works in Windows. Uh, in Ubuntu, you have, um, a language uh, settings where you can install different locales. So if you go to uh, the gear menu, system settings, you go to uh, language and uh, uh, language and date options, I think it is, regional options, you'll have a list of languages, you click add, you have a list of like 200 languages. Um, you just click the ones you want to add, hit OK, and it installs not just the um, all the translations, if you want them, but also all the uh, language proofing tools, spell checkers, hyphenator, dictionaries, grammar checkers, and so on. So. Um, Free software, so Ubuntu makes that really super easy. It can't be that difficult on Windows either, I'm certain, but um, Ubuntu rolls up all those language stuff for all software on the entire system, including LibreOffice. But yeah, your word processor uh, is going to help you out there, so. Um, uh, do, that, do that for non-Roman characters? Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. It doesn't matter, there's Greek, Russian, uh, uh, Czech, Japanese, Chinese, uh, all sorts of things. In fact, in my book, I had to uh, do some research uh, for uh, uh, Japanese to get stuff on there and talk about how you enter in text. And I did actually switch, I think I switched the language uh, in LibreOffice. It's in your book? Uh, it's, it's mentioned in my book. It's, it is mentioned in my book that's coming out. Um, is and that Sanji as well as the Kana? Yeah, the, the, it's called an input method editor and it handles, so you, the way it works, you type, uh, you type in the language phonetically and it starts uh, putting in Kana. You can switch between uh, kanji mode and then kana mode, hiragana, katakana, you can switch. And so usually you type everything in in hiragana and uh, you will hit. You finish the word, you hit space bar and it'll show you the actual uh, kanji and you can switch over. But usually the ones I've seen they have like, because there's so many that have the same 
Semantic yeah, it, g it gives you a menu. It gives you a list. Yeah, and you, you, you hit spacebar, it gives you a list, and then you can convert it because it, it can't be done automatically. So that's 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 what that does. And then LibreOffice has the dictionary that makes sure that uh, uh, that everything. I don't know if it's spelled correctly. I guess that maybe for hiragana, probably not kanji. But LibreOffice has language proofing tools that makes that easier. So uh, yes. Two questions. The uh, traditional publisher uh, supplies the ISBN number. In the contract, he takes so care of that. First question is uh, who? So when you're traditionally publishing, traditional publisher. Well, I'm, repeat, I'm repeating for the for the video because I'm mic'd and you're not. Um, so uh, when you're traditionally publishing, um, who supplies the ISBN number? The publisher, publisher, or the, or the agent? Yeah. So the ISBN number is the. Um, Library. I don't know what it stands for. International Book Standard, standard, standard Number book Number. Standard number, book number. Some book, standard like book that. number. Oh, ISBN International <laughs> Standard Book Number. Right. So uh, it's a unique identifier that identifies a single edition of a printed work. Um, so a second edition is going to have a different ISBN. A hard copy, and a hardback rather, and a paperback is going to have a different ISBN. Uh, they're going to be unique. So um, the publisher supplies the ISBN. Okay. Um, you can buy them uh, from uh, Boker, is the uh, company who, who administers them in the US. If you're Canadian, um, uh, the Canadian government will supply you one for free. So you get free healthcare and free ISBN numbers. It's not too bad um, because it, um, it, uh, it's one of the things the government does is to promote the arts. Um, you know, one of the things that they take your tax money for, they want to promote uh, Canadian uh, uh, culture. So, they, so you can get a free ISBN number in Canada if you're self-publishing. Uh, if you're traditionally publishing, your publisher, that's one of the things your publisher just deals with. Um, ISBN numbers are pretty expensive. You can buy one for about 100 bucks. You can buy, um, you can buy 10 for, uh, Probably more like 80 bucks each. It goes down. You buy a thousand, they're like a dollar a piece, right? So your publisher bought a bunch of them, um, and it identifies not just the publisher because the who owns what ISBN is registered, so you can tell what the publisher is, um, but also um, uh, you know you need one for each book. So your publisher takes care of, takes care of that. If you're self-publishing, uh, that um, was what I was wanting to find out about the uh, self-publishing and electronically, and. When would be a good time to use it, when not to use it? Okay, so uh, the question is, uh, when you're self-publishing, when's a good time to use the ISBN and, and when not to? So um, when you're self-publishing, that's one, I said, the publisher's responsible. You're self-publishing, you're the publisher, you're responsible for ISBN. So the way that works is that uh, eBooks can have an ISBN. They need a separate and distinct ISBN from the print book. You cannot use one Word document and send it to uh, Kindle Direct Publishing for, for a Kindle file and then send it to CreateSpace and use one ISBN. There are two different editions of the book, you need two ISBNs. Ebooks don't need ISBNs. Uh, Amazon assigns uh, an ASBN, an Amazon standard book number, which is completely separate, uh, that works just, just as well. But in fact, I don't, think, I don't even think the ISBN even appears in the URL, unless they just use the ISBN for the ASBN. Um, Ebooks don't need them. If you upload to CreateSpace or Ingram, uh, Ingram Spark uh, or Smashwords, they will provide you an ISBN, a free ISBN. The trick then is that it will, so a, if you walk into a bookstore, say I'd like to order this fantastic book that, by the way, you should probably buy 30 of them from the shelves, but I want this one now, uh, they'll know whether or not that came from Amazon or not. And if it's self-published, um, they're probably not going, the bookstore is probably not going to be like, get out of here, we're not going to, you know, some guy just published the book, right? Um, but um, you do need an you don't need an ISBN to sell books. You don't need an ISBN to print them. Uh, people don't need an ISBN to uh, to buy them, although it makes it easier to search. Uh, but you do need an ISBN number if you want to um, get a book into a library uh, or into a bookstore. So that's very important. Um, so a lot of times your print on demand, if you do a print book, will supply that for you. You can also buy them uh, yourself. And if you buy like five at a time, ten at a time, it starts to get more economical. I don't recommend buying a plus you, can, you it's registered to you and you can it looks more professional I don't know how many of you have ever looked up an ISBN just find out who the publisher was who was registered the ISBN uh, no one ever does it's one of those vanity things sometimes people look for when you put a book on Amazon you do not need an ISBN if you're going through Kindle direct publishing uh, if you are, uh, if you if you have the books and you want to use their vendor uh, sales, I don't think you need an ISP number for that either. But but you do need that for so. On the other hand, um, uh, you you might need that uh, to end up on the book section. But if you're if you're self-publishing uh, directly through them, you do not need an ISP number. So uh, talk to me and we'll we'll figure that out. Uh, it's 
probably something simple and, and either we'll know that yes you do or there's a workaround and you choose what you want to do. Another question as far as digital rights. Um, we do the typing stuff and we have a classroom environment and I'd like to issue a right for the teacher to be able to print their own copies of materials for mm -hmm. students. Any ideas on that? So you want to... Uh, you, you, what do you want them to be able to print? Uh, you, so you're writing a textbook, you want them to be able to reproduce for class use? Okay, so the way that works, so the way DRM works is that you can copy or you can't, that's, that's the end. Um, so uh, I don't know of any DRM restrictions. I don't think any of the uh, major ebook publishers have DRM that lets you say you can copy this many copies of this many pages. Uh, so DRM is a technological solution uh, if you want to, for, uh, for educational use, if you want to authorize teachers that use your book in the classroom to, uh, to make a um, you know, limited amount of copies for their class um, for the educational purpose, you can just say that. On your, cop on your copyright page, you can, you then that, what that does, that grants, that's a copyright license uh, that you grant the reader of the book under a certain set of circumstances. Um, they, so when you when you write something, you autom when you create a creative work, you automatically own the copyright. It's a it's a, a, a legal uh, monopoly on the rights to copy and reproduce a work. It's just yours. That's the way it works. Nobody else has any right to reproduce that work under copyright law, with unless it's it's been granted to them. So the creator has an automatic, a natural grant. Um, that being said, um, you can give anyone the right to copy anything you want at any point under any restrictions or circumstances at all. So that's how the GPL works. That's how the Creative Commons licenses work, um, actually. So, so you're able to, um, you're able, if you, if you want to say, if, if you don't care for the teachers copying a couple pages for the students so they can hand, use them in the handouts, you can just say that. And then it's okay for them to, because you gave them permission. Yeah, the creative the thing um, makes the law right. for a thing. If you self-publish, if you traditionally publish, you still own the copyright. Um, a Press is going to register when the book's all ready to go. They're going to send it to the Library of Congress. It's going to get catalog categorized. They're going to register the copyright in my name. It's my copyright. But I have given them the exclusive right to publish, so I'm not able to... Uh, uh, I can publish excerpts uh, up to 10% at a time. I get to keep all the money for that when I do it. I can use the book in... Uh, classes that I teach or supervise, it's specific. That was all in the standard contract. Um, other than that, they have all, all rights. I don't. I, I sign them away for money. Um, but if you self-publish, and, and that was something I had the right to do. I made the decision because it was my, my right to give away. But if you self-publish, yeah, you can just say uh, teachers under these circumstances can do these things also. So, so you just charge an initial pricing then for that particular type of book that you copy the book? You could, I would say, if you're selling a textbook, uh, that's just kind of a nice thing to do uh, anyway. Like if you have a couple worksheet pages, um, they're still, still going to have to buy the book and teach out of it to to copy them. So I personally, I probably wouldn't raise the price of the book uh, if I wanted to make it copyable because it's limited, right? If you if, if you want to say uh, here's a book and you can and you can photocopy copies for all your students, yeah, you're going to charge five times more for the book. You know, my, my thinking is there's a thousand students going to use my book. And mm -hmm. I can't yeah, so so you you want to price appropriately for that you know, in that case, but if, if it's like you know ten pages out of a three hundred page book, you might just say whatever, because then teachers will oh I can copy this I'm going to buy this book and the book gets more popular sells that way, but if it's instructor only manual then yeah you might want to price it accordingly um, you'll have to look at what other other books are doing and, and kind of price accordingly I think so uh, uh, yes you you keep uh, speaking about uh, human grammar checkers hmm. and. I know grammar checkers are older and dirt because I got one for Dawson Windows because mm -hmm. I sell some legacy software under that. But in Linus, what do you use for a grammar checker? I mean, you're talking about using people, but is there a grammar sure. checker for Linus? Uh, so are there are there a grammar are there uh, automated uh, computer grammar checkers for for Linux? Um, no good. <laughs> I would say that they are just as good as uh, the ones for uh, built into um, Office, you know, for Windows and Mac, which is which is to say not Libre very good. LibreOffice really does have uh, spelling and grammar check oh. uh, on a per language basis. So, uh, for example, um, uh, you can install Latin support. There is no grammar checker for that. Although that would probably be the easiest thing to check for is uh, automatically is Latin. That's a bad example. Uh, German is one of the hardest things if you ask me, but that has a grammar checker. Some of the other languages some don't. Conversations with Henry and um, that. <laughs> so, where it's going to be sold because 
the one book I read this year was Confessions of a Comma Queen, and she's an editor for the New Yorker magazine. Mm. And they don't they don't use conventional spelling. They don't use conventional grammar. They right. they do their style sheet. Well, I mean, the newspapers have a different style. Sheet. That's just, yeah yeah every every Your publishing market. house has different styles, and you can you can add. Um, I have a ton of. Uh, Ubuntu is in the uh, default uh, uh, dictionary for LibreOffice on Ubuntu, uh, oddly enough. Uh, it's on Android, actually, too. Um, but yeah, I, I always add tons of words. Anytime I'm writing sci-fi sci or fantasy, yeah, there's going to be a lot of... Uh, my user dictionary is going to be really big. Those, those um, grammar checkers on a computer, they don't like certain things, especially... Yeah, the, the problem with grammar checking is that um, no computers don't comprehend. That's right. They don't have context. So um, computers aren't able to take a look at what you've... Um, of what you've written and understand it, so they can't tell you if the grammar is correct. They can they can flag some common uh, common mistakes. Grammar checkers aren't worthless because they can flag some things you missed, but you don't want to rely on them. You yeah. definitely want to hire someone That's to do it, right. and it's really really hard to to, to proofread yourself. So, uh, yeah. um, are there any other questions? Okay, so in that case, uh, I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation, and uh, the slides will be available online later. And uh, if you have any specific questions. Uh, my email address, I think, was in the beginning of the presentation. That is my real email address, nhaines at ubuntu.com. You are more than welcome to uh, write me to ask uh, specific questions, and uh, I'll try and uh, get back to you and, and you know find the best resource for you. So thank you again.